Good morning, church. <clears throat> good to see you this morning. Always good to see the house of the Lord nice and full. And uh, glad you've chosen to come and worship with us this morning. How many of you are cat people? How many of you are dog people? Okay. Some of you are both. <laughs> right. A woman. The story is told of a woman who rescued a puppy from a pound, from a... Uh, from, you know, our equivalent of the SBCA, I guess. And uh, this dog was on death row, and she adopted this puppy and uh, took it home with her. She formed a very strong bond with this dog of hers, this uh, puppy dog. And uh, the dog grew, and the dog knew the rules of the house, and the dog went with her wherever she went. And the dog knew that you did not sleep on the bed. The dog knew that you don't jump up on people. The dog knew that you don't sit on the couch unless you're on the lap of the master. But one day, one night, as the woman was lying in bed, suddenly the dog jumped up on the bed and started licking her all over the face, which is why I don't like dogs. And uh, anyway, she thought the dog was simply being naughty, and so she chucked the dog off the bed and said some things to the dog in a harsh tone and thought that would be it. Next night, dog jumped up on the bed, started licking her all over the face again. She got a bit annoyed by this, chucked the dog off the bed, said a few harsh tones to it again, and went to sleep. Next night, the dog jumped up on the bed, started licking her on the face, and so on, and so on, and so on. And she started to think to herself, what has gone wrong with this dog? The dog knows the rules of the house. This is not what we do. Dogs do not belong on the bed. They do not lick people on the face. But anyway, eventually she started to think, maybe what the dog needs is obedience school. And so she was making plans to uh, take the dog to obedience school. One day, she was sitting on the couch, and the dog ran up, jumped on her lap, and started licking her on the face. She was rather annoyed. Why and where did this dog get this habit from of jumping up and licking her in the face? And as she was still sitting there, rather grumpy, thinking about this, wondering what had gone wrong with her as the teacher, as the master, and the dog as the, as the obedient puppy, as she was thinking about obedience school, a thought came to her mind. This dog keeps licking me in the same place on my face. What's up with that? Strange behavior. And so knowing that dogs and pets sometimes know things that humans don't, you know, like when there's a disaster coming, an earthquake or something of the like, she decided that she would trust this little voice in her head, trust what the dog had been doing, and so she went off to the doctor. She got to the doctor and very sheepishly explained that she had come to the doctor because the dog licked her in the face. <laughs> the doctor decided, okay, well, we'll check it out. You're here now and ran some tests, and sure enough, in the jaw was an osteocarcinoma, a very small, you could not feel it from the outside, but a small cancerous tumor, which was able to be treated, and the woman survived. The doctor said to her, if she had waited until it was large enough to be felt from the outside, she would probably not have survived. It's a strange story, right? An entity, a being, a dog, without the ability to communicate in a language we understand, without being able to communicate using human language, was able to get through to this woman who at first didn't get it, but eventually realized the dog was trying to tell her something. She decided to put her faith and her trust in this thing that she couldn't entirely understand. She couldn't entirely make sense of something which science probably simply would have dismissed because it doesn't have the capacity to measure it or to understand it or to quantify it or to put it in a test tube, to touch it and to handle it. She decided to trust the sense. In the Gospel of John, chapter 20, it says in verse 30, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. John here highlights why you have the Bible in your possession. John highlights the reason God has seen fit to inspire the prophets, to inspire the Bible writers with the testimony of Scripture. Because when you hold this book in your hand, when you read its stories in a way that cannot be entirely quantified, in a way that's not entirely scientifically verifiable, in a way that's not entirely understandable, the Word of God speaks to us in a powerful and profound way. And if you will listen to the voice of Scripture, if you will listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you through this book called the Scriptures, 
in a way that you may not be able to audibly understand or perceive, but that you can sense. If you will be sensitive enough to sit back and to stop and to listen, you will know the voice of God to your, to your soul. It will save you from the destruction to come. It will bring you to the experience of eternal life. John says there's many, many other things that were not recorded in Scripture that God did in miraculous and amazing ways in times past. I'd suggest to you that there's many miraculous and amazing things He continues to do today if we will stop and listen and be quiet in His presence. Sometimes it's the annoying things of life. Sometimes it's the repetitive things of life where the Holy Spirit is trying to get your attention. Like that dog that night after night kept jumping up onto the bed, annoying its master. Like that dog who kept licking its master in the face. It's like God knows the human psyche. We're slow to learn. We're slow to understand. What are the patterns that are unfolding in your life? What are, where are the places where the Holy Spirit may just be constantly bringing something to your attention again and again? The Bible is full of amazing stories, starting in the very beginning with the story of creation, the story of a God who interposes in a miraculous way by the power of his voice, by the tender care of his hands, the breathing of, of the gift of life into the clay-molded form of Adam and Eve, bringing this world into existence. There's the story of the fall, the story of how it all went wrong, how we linked up with someone who took our loyalty and our allegiance away from God. There is the story of how God pursues human beings down through the ages. There are amazing stories of how God will do anything to preserve his family and protect the lineage of truth in this world. He's destroyed the world once before by a blanket of water. He hit the reset button. Why? For the sake of the plan of redemption, for the sake of the salvation of the world. There's nothing that the Father would not do to redeem his children from the one who stole their hearts, from the one who would enslave them. We encounter an amazing story with the, with the Israelites redeemed from Egyptian slavery, brought to a place where they had nowhere to go, mountain on the left, mountain on the right, a sea of immense proportions ahead of them, and an Egyptian army behind. And we see God interposing with a cloud of darkness to prevent the Egyptians from approaching too close. We see him parting the river or the, or the waters of the, the Red Sea. We see them marching through on dry land. We see that same water collapsing in on the Egyptians to redeem God's people. God would stop at nothing to redeem his children. We see those same, those same children rebelling in the wilderness, wandering around for 40 years until eventually the next generation inherits the promise that God made to them. They enter the promised land, and the very first thing they come up against is, is basically the same as the Red Sea. It's a fortified city called Jericho. And God tells them simply to march, simply to walk, simply to keep moving at his instructions. And he crumbles those mighty fortress walls like they're dust. And the children of Israel enter into the promised land. We continue to read miraculous stories like this all the way through until you get to the greatest story of all. The story of how the, created, the creator God becomes a part of his creation. The creator God who was always outside of creation, who had always lent life to creation. The creator God through the miracle of what we call the incarnation. God becomes a man. He steps into human flesh. He takes the burden of our mortality upon himself. He lives our life. He suffers at our hands. He suffers on account of our sin. He dies on the cross, and then there is the miracle of the resurrection that assures you and I of the gift of salvation. This Jesus ascends to heaven and bestows upon the church the gift of the Holy Spirit, making a profound and miraculous first appearance, like thunder going through a building, rattling the bones of the building, little tongues of fire resting upon the disciples empowering them to do what Jesus had commanded them to do, to tell the story of the plan of salvation. All throughout Scripture, you and I have these stories, these historical accounts, these interventions of the divine being in history, designed to inspire trust, 
designed to awaken you to your need, to tell you of the hope that lies beyond this world, to remind you in your hour of darkness that it is still worthwhile getting up in the morning, that the whole of history is headed in a certain direction back towards face to face with God. That whatever you face, your sickness, your disease, your difficulties, your insurmountable problems, your poverty, your weaknesses, whatever you encounter in this world, this world has already been overcome. The God of the miraculous still lives. The God of redemption still saves. This is the purpose of Scripture. Are you paying attention to its stories? Are you listening to the voice of God? Is the Holy Spirit jumping up on your lap and licking you in, in your face repeatedly, trying to get your attention in some area of your life that you're blind to the cancer of sin? The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you will have life by the power of His name. Everything in this world is designed to detract from belief in Christ. Everything in this world is designed to attract your attention to the physical, to what you can see, to what you can touch, to what you can handle in this realm. Everything in this world is designed to tell you that there is no hope, that we are going nowhere. From the philosophy of our origins to the fact that there simply is no God by the, by the atheistic assumptions, that everything in this world is designed to do the opposite of getting you to believe in God. So let me tell you this bluntly. If you are not reading this book, if you are not paying attention to this, over time you will come to not believe. This is the voice of God to your soul. I want you to turn with me to the book of Psalm, chapter 25. Psalm 25, and it reads like this. This is the testimony of David. This is the voice of a man, a mortal like you and I, surrounded with much of the same distractions, with responsibilities bearing down upon him. And this is what he says in Psalm 25, O Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point me, point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me all day long. I put my hope in you. Pause there for a moment. I want you to hear this in the voice of the psalmist. I want you to hear a man caught up in prayer, uh, because that's what this is, right? This is a written down prayer. This is his prayer journal. That's what the book of Psalms is. It's songs and prayers written by a man in communion with God. I want you to see yourself standing in the corner of his room as he pours out his soul to the Lord. I want you to see this mighty man, a king on the throne. I want you to see this man surrounded by all the might of the world, and yet this man who realizes that none of it matters if his hope is not in the Lord. I want you to hear a man expressing a prayer of humility and of trust and of faith in God, a man who recognizes that at the pinnacle of success, everything that is accomplished is by the grace of God. I want you to hear a man who recognizes that even at the pinnacle of success, he is a mere mortal and subject to death. That in a moment, everything he has loved in this world can be taken from him. That in a moment, everything he rejoices in this world can be gone. I want you to hear a man whose priorities is to look to the Lord, to put his trust and his faith in this God. You see, according to John, this is written that you might believe. This is written that you might learn to have communion with God like David did. This is written so that you might learn to pray in the spirit that the psalmist prayed in. That you might learn to have that kind of intimacy and connection with a God who is as real as the person sitting next to you, though you do not see that God with your eyes. So listen for this as you hear this man praying. Remember, verse 6, remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love which you have shown from long ages past. 
Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of the way. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness and all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. For the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. They will live in prosperity and their children will, children will inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant my eyes are always on the Lord, for he rescues me from the traps of my enemies. Feel my pain and see my trouble. Forgive all my sins. See how many enemies I have and how viciously they hate me. Protect me. Rescue my life from them. Do not let me be disgraced, for in you I take refuge. May integrity and honesty protect me, for I put my hope in you. O oh God, ransom Israel from all its troubles. That, friends, is the prayer of trust. It is the prayer of faith. It is the prayer of surrender. It is the prayer of finding strength in the only place of lasting strength, of emptying the soul of its pride, of relinquishing the appearances of the world, and committing to the things that you cannot see with your eyes. According to John, this was written that you might believe. According to John, this was written that you might learn how to pray. According to John, this was written so that you would find that place of sweet communion that the psalmist found. The whole of Scripture is written that you might have the voice of God to speak to you. How often do you stop and listen? How often do you pause to be refreshed? Or do you race on through the days of life? Similar to this, if you turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. Jeremiah 17 and the prophet says the following. This is the blessing of trusting in the Lord, contrasted with trusting in oneself. Jeremiah 17 from verse 5 this is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness and in an uninhabited salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried about long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. The human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. You see, that's why you need the voice of the Lord to speak to you. Because if you trust in yourself, in your abilities, if you trust in your, 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 your ability to perceive right from wrong and good from bad, the Bible warns you, you are blind. Your heart is deceitful above all else. You cannot trust your own motives. You know the story well, the person who does the right thing for all the wrong reasons. You know, as parents, we reprimand our children because they speak to us disrespectfully and we think we're training them in the way of the Lord. Meanwhile, it is the pride of our own heart that hates to be insulted. That's why we reprimanded them. Does that make sense to you? I think I'm doing it for the right reason. I'm doing what the Lord told me to do. I'm a parent training my child in the way of righteousness. And yes, you should reprimand your, reprimand your child if they're being disrespectful to you. Honor, the fa honor thy father and mother, right, is the fifth commandment. Yes, that is the right thing to do. But what I'm saying to you, what Jeremiah is saying, is that you, sometimes we don't recognize what drives our own hearts. We are confused by the deceitfulness of sin within us. We do the right things for the wrong reasons. We return tithes and offerings, the right thing to do, sometimes for the wrong reasons. 
like the story of Jesus in the New Testament with the woman who dropped the two mites into the, into the, into the offering plate while all the others gave from their excess. And what does Jesus say about that? He says, I see what they're giving, but they give for the wrong motive. You see, you can do the right things religiously. You can do the right things parentally. You can do the right things even as children, right? How many times, how many times in my own household with my own children has there been a moment of, what shall we call it, disobedience? Which if you promise an ice cream or an outing, suddenly there's incredible compliance that is rendered. Why? Because by doing what is right, I get what I want. I have not done what is right because it is right. I've done what it is right because it serves me in this moment to do what is right. At another moment, doing what is wrong will serve me. But in this moment, doing what is right serves the selfish desires of my heart. See, the heart is deceitful above all else. You cannot trust in princes. You cannot trust in yourself. You need the voice of God. You need to take time to hear the voice of God. You need to read the stories again and again. The Holy Spirit needs to be looking you all over the face to make you aware of where the cancerous sin resides within you that you are blind to. You need to spend time in the voice of God, with the voice of God. Because if you're not, you will slowly, over time, drift towards unbelief. There is a New Testament equivalent to this passage in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. It's the well-known story of the wise man and the foolish man. You know how that goes, right? End of chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says this, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it will not collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. That is the equivalent of the plants growing in the wilderness or the plants growing besides the water. They will grow beside the water. Their roots go down deep. They drink of that water. And though their circumstances around them are like a drought, though around them there is no hope, there is no rain clouds on the horizon, there is simply a hot wind blowing, still they remain green because they're tapped into the source of life beneath the surface of the earth. This is the equivalent of the man who builds his house on the bedrock of Jesus' teaching. Though the storms may come, though they may rage, though times may be hard, though things may be difficult, though everything in this world militates towards unbelief, still the one who is built on the teachings of Christ, his foundation is glued to that which cannot shake, to that which cannot change, to that which never cracks to that which will support the building of the house for all of eternity. Matthew 7, Jeremiah 17, the same idea. The example of David in Psalm 25, an individual pouring out his soul to God, expressing his dependence and his reliance upon God, the recognition that all that I have is because of you. All of my deliverance, past and future, will be because of you. Everything is on account of God. You and I need to be glued to the base, to the bedrock of the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's why the scriptures were given to you, that you might believe, that you may read and understand that there are things that defy science, that you might understand that, there, that, that we believe in a God who is above and beyond, who, a God who, who cannot be understood merely by the laws of this world and this universe, a God who must be understood on his own terms by his personal revelation. The scriptures. The scriptures were given to you that you might believe in a world that militates towards unbelief. Amidst circumstances that say there is no God, in the midst of suffering and trial and ordeal, you have been given the word of God that you might understand those sufferings and those ordeals. You've been given the word of God to understand that in the midst of death there is the hope of the resurrection, that in the midst of guilt there is the assurance of forgiveness. 
You have been given the word of God that you might understand that in the midst of loneliness, you have been accepted and loved and adopted into the family of God. You've been given the word of God that you might understand that when life seems aimless and pointless and like you're simply treading water, going around in circles, you might understand that the whole of history, your short life, is headed towards face to face with God again. You have been given the scriptures so that when the world falls apart, you might understand that these things were prophesied. That there, is a, that there is a being in this world, in this universe, who reads the future like you and I read a history book. You've been given the scriptures that you might believe in the one who saves your soul. Just a few verses before where we started in, in the Gospel of John there is the story of Thomas. The disciples of old had encountered the risen Jesus Christ. They had seen him face to face. The woman had been at the tomb. They had seen the empty tomb. There had been two men on the road to Emmaus that evening who encountered the living Jesus. Overcome by their grief, they could not see what was in front of them. Overcome by the circumstances of this world, the lies of this world, they did not, they did not recall to their mind the prophecies that foretold the death and the resurrection of the Messiah. Jesus had revealed himself to them. They had run back and told the other disciples. All of this had happened. And when Thomas was told testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony from people he had history with, from people he trusted, from people he believed, from people he had been on the journey with, these were not strangers. These were not aliens. These were not people who had not shared the last three and a half years with him. These were people whom he trusted. He would not believe. And so Jesus in his condescension and his mercy shows up that day, that evening, in a locked upper room and he says, to, he says to Thomas, come, come forward Thomas, come touch and feel, put your hand in my side, feel where the spear went in, look at the scars of my hands, give me something to eat so that you will believe that I am physical, that I am real, that I am the resurrected Jesus Christ. When Thomas encountered the living Jesus, he cried out, My Lord and my God. To which Jesus said, Blessed are you, Thomas, for believing what you have seen. But more blessed are those who will believe without seeing. That's you and me. Jesus had you and me in mind when he spoke to Thomas. In a world such as ours, materialistic in, or, or, in nature, a world such as ours, scientific in orient, orientation, a world such as ours that demands evidence, it's like God was looking, Jesus was looking down through the ages, standing in front of Thomas and going, but blessed are they who despite the age that they live in, despite the evidences that are demand, will choose to believe without seeing because of the testimony of those who have spoken before them. Because of the testimony of Thomas, because of the testimony of Peter, because of the testimony of Mary, because of the testimony of Moses, because of the testimony of Elijah. Blessed are those who will believe despite the age that demands physical evidence. Blessed are they who will believe because they have heard the voice of God through the scriptures speaking to them. Because they have gained an experience like David in the audience, of, in the audience chamber with the Lord, where they've gained an experience of a personal heartfelt surrender to the Lord blessed are those who will believe without seeing you see you and I have been given this treasure and I want to ask you a personal question when last did you have an experience in the word when last did you stop long enough to hear what the Holy Spirit would say to you to be annoyed by his licking you all over your sinful propensities, awakening you to your need of the Savior, the need of confession. When last did you spend time listening to the voice of the Lord? There was a man on a plane headed home to be with his family. And as the story goes, it was time for the drinks to be served, as they do on a plane, right? But just at about that time, the little seatbelt light came on, 
And a voice from the cockpit said, unfortunately, we will not be able to serve drinks at this time because we're headed into a little bit of turbulence. And so everyone buckled up their seat belts and got ready for a little bit of turbulence, right? Time passed. No turbulence came. Eventually, the voice came over the intercom again saying, we're about to arrive at the turbulence. We won't be able to serve the meal at this time because of the turbulence. Still, everyone remained buckled in and patiently awaiting the turbulence. Some more time passed. Nothing happened. And then they saw the flashes of lightning out the windows. They saw the dark clouds, and the plane began to rattle. This wasn't a little bit of turbulence. This was a significant storm that they couldn't go over, they couldn't go under, they couldn't go around, and there was only one pathway through the storm, and that was through the storm. Seat belts buckled, plane bending and twisting, bobbing up and down. You know that great experience when you're flying and suddenly the plane drops by a few meters, your stomach stays up there. Again and again that happened. People became visibly uneasy. It was that kind of storm, that kind of turbulence that went beyond a mere rattle of inconvenience to the place where you start to wonder whether the wings are going to be ripped off the side of the plane. And up and down the plane bounced and from side to side it was shaken. And in the midst of the turmoil, in the midst of the people praying, in the midst of the people calling out to God, in the midst of people clutching their seats with white knuckles, holding on for dear life, this man looks across the aisle and he sees a child, probably no older than 12 or 13, sitting with her legs calmly folded under her, seatbelt on, reading a book. Occasionally she would close her eyes for a little while, and she'd open her eyes and carry on reading. She wasn't like the other passengers who were either gripping their seats tightly or saying their prayers. She was perfectly calm, perfectly composed, simply riding the storm out in the plane. The plane landed, people disembarked, and this man, intrigued by this little girl, walked over to her and said, that was quite a storm, wasn't it? I couldn't help but notice that you were reading your book and you were quite calm. To which this young girl replied, that's right, my dad is the captain, and he was flying me home. Friends, you and I have been given the word of God because the Lord is bringing us safely in to the airport. You and I are about to pass through times which Daniel calls a time of trouble such as never before. You and I have the voice of God with us today in this day and age that militates towards unbelief. And I'm asking you, do you trust the captain enough to bring your plane safe to its landing? Do you listen to the voice of God? Do you take time to be refreshed by his presence? You need the calmness of that little girl you need to know that your heavenly Father is the one in the cockpit, that he has his hand on the joystick, that whatever the storms of life are, you are safe with him as the captain of your plane. And the only way you will know that is if you're spending time in his presence. So I'm challenging you in the coming week. Let it be a week in the presence of God not like this past week. And if this past week was in the presence of God, let it be more so. I'm challenging you to take time to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, to spend time in the Word of God. Let me pray with you. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for the reminder in your Word to trust and to believe. We thank you, Lord, that even in this day and age, you are alive, you are well, and the promise of salvation is as real to us today as it was to the disciples of old. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us the assurance that you are bringing us safe, safe to the house of God. And I simply pray for every person here this morning that you will put your spirit upon us, that you will live in us and through us, 
that, your word of, that the word of God will come alive every time we open it. I pray, Lord, that you will speak to us and that each of us, like David, will gain that personal experience of surrender, that personal experience in your presence. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song in closing, a song of response. Jesus, keep me near the cross. We're going to stand together as we sing. Thank you, Claire.